Greetings, welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing abrupt climate change. And uh, thank you guys always for your comments and participation in the channel. Um, there wasn't a, a um, there wasn't too much, uh, I guess, response to, or negative response to uh, my my rants on the comment section. Thank you guys for understanding. I'm just, you know, my main focus is just to be inclusive for people. I want to, you know, include as many people in the conversation as possible. Uh, you know, that's why I don't, you know, chase people away. I encourage people to come and hang out and listen as much as possible, even if they don't get the science. Um, even if they come in, you know, angry like bull, um, you know, I really try not to just, you know, slam people, <clears throat> slam people down the chute if, if possible, but, uh, you know, and for those, uh, who understand all this, uh, I thank you. And that's pretty much everybody. So, um, you guys are a smart bunch and, uh, I'm lucky to have the viewers and the followers that I do. Um, thank you for making this channel possible. Um, yeah, just, you know, I'm going to read some articles, more evidence that we are in trouble. Um, you know, some people who question the science, um, you know, continue to hop on the channel and kind of say stuff that, you know, really at the very basis of your argument is that you are ignoring reality in order to believe this other um this other story you know whatever it is that it's not co2 that you know i really liked the part uh of the article i was reading yesterday that you know even if you don't believe co2 is a warming mechanism it still is going to have um ser do serious harm to <clears throat> the oceans uh, our food as well as other things but you know uh, CO2 as a warming mechanism is based in science and it's just, it's basic physics. You can't, you know, you can't try and like out argue that one. It's not up for your argument. It's not up for your debate. That's not up for debate. It's, it's done. It's settled. It's science. Um, so just, you know, hang out and listen. If you don't believe the science or if you don't agree with it, I encourage you to hang out and listen, but please like refrain from, commenting with those comments if you can uh because they're not going to go anywhere and they're not going to get any far and nobody's buying what you're selling um and but you know this seems to be a problem and uh i'm going to give you some insight as to why this is from truth out from today <clears throat> bradley foundation funds web of client climate change deniers bradley foundation internal documents reviewed by the center for media and democracy reveal a concerted effort by the organization to delegitimize climate science while promoting fossil fuel energy development in the united states an analysis of Bradley's climate-related activities show that the foundation has made significant grants to support energy policy think tanks, attack dog groups that target environmentalists, and efforts to discredit climate science. And of course, this has been going on for a long time. A 2013 internal foundation document details how Bradley instructed staff to explore options to make more energy-related grants. The document also notes that the board gave a terminal grant of $263,000 and $591,000 to the Sand County Foundation, which previously administered the Bradley Fund for the Environment. The documents do not reveal Bradley's motivation in splitting from SCF, but they do outline a serious effort to promote fossil fuel industry in interests at the expense of the environment. Centers for Climate Change Denial and Fossil Fuel Development <clears throat> 
as part of its push to support studies and public relations to cast doubt on mounting scientific evidence on climate change, Bradley has focused its resources on energy policy centers, uh, many of which are housed in Bradley supported state policy network think tanks. SPN is a web of 156 right wing groups in 59 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Canada, and the UK that receives funding from the billionaire Koch brothers, the Bradley Foundation, and the Roe Foundation, as well as many multinational corporations. The examined documents show that the Center for Energy Policy and the Environment at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, a member of SPN, received a total of $500,000 for its center, with another $200,000 distributed in 2016. CEPE works to promote fossil fuel development despite the devastating effects of climate change. A background document on CEPE just states it, its goal clearly. The center's research and public education activity aims at demonstrating that the United States is poised to reap substantial economic benefits in the form of job creation. Lower gasoline and electricity prices and increased productivity provided Public policies allow companies to access valuable energy resources and distribute them at home and abroad. A recommendation by Bradley staff on the Manhattan Institute's 2016 grant proposal specifically states that CEPE is worth funding because they have succeeded in identifying and publicizing so many of the falsehoods that surround energy and environment. An example of the success can be found in the work of CEPE senior, uh, senior fellow Mark Mills, who was recognized as originating the idea that North America can surpass the Middle East <laughs> as the largest energy, energy supplier in the world. The Energy Policy Center at, at another SPN think tank, the Independence Institute, received $195,000 from the Bradley Foundation between 2012 and 2016. Bradley documents examine show the EPC's purpose is to consciously counterbalance former Colorado Governor Bill Ritter's environmental think tank at Colorado State University, which promotes a new energy economy. Bradley considers EPC to be highly successful, successful in fighting, fighting local and federal environmental initiatives. The Bradley documents note that EPC was a key coalition partner in preempting local bans on fracking in Colorado, and that is developed the toolkit for policymakers, attorney general, attorneys general and other conservative state think tanks to help them push back against U.S. Environmental Protection Agency regulations. In addition to these two centers, Bradley has funded the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, an associate member of SPN and the Center for Energy, Innovation and Independence at Consumers Research. CEE is led by prominent climate change denier, Myron Ebel, who steered Trump's EPA transition team. Ebel also chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition, which brings together right-wing activists and scholars for monthly meetings. The coalition was established on May 6, 1997, to dispel the myths of global warming by exposing flawed economic, scientific, and risk analysis. Yeah, CEI was long tied to tobacco disinformation campaigns, but is now a leading organization in the movement to discredit climate science. Um, at, some, at the same time Bradley rolled out funding for energy policy centers, it was do, doling out cash to discredit environmental organizations and climate change science. I don't know that I'm gonna read this whole thing, but you guys get the idea. You guys get the idea. There are large and uh, moneyed sources <clears throat> funding this <clears throat> anti-climate change science. I mean, uh, yeah, funding these groups. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to link this below and you guys can check out the rest of that article. Um, if we ever had time <clears throat> to turn things around, <clears throat> this is one of the main reasons why we did not do that. Why we have not taken 
the appropriate steps in time to possibly save ourselves and the planet. Um, dear climate change deniers, uh, you are under the influence of disinformation. Also understand that the US military uh, knows very, very well <laughs> Uh, that climate change is uh, a huge threat. Um, you know, all of those rah-rah patriot climate change is a hoax people. Go ask any military leader about climate change and they'll tell you how real it is and what a threat it is. Um, but they are serving two masters uh, so they can't actually do any real, um, you can't do any real mitigation right now because they're in the business of staying in business and of securing all the oil sources um, that they possibly can secure in the world because, you know, this is what we're going to do is fight over every last drop of oil. That is much more important than, you know, possibly turning this thing around. Uh, and the insanity continues. This next article is from The Guardian. Uh, I believe Terry sent me this. Um, from today, Sarah Butler writes, uh, UK imports salad from US, Spain, and Poland as heat wave hits crops. Wholesale prices soar by more than 30% and farmers have to renegotiate with supermarkets. Uh, lettuce is being flown in from the U.S. and imported from Spain and Poland as soaring temperatures increase demand but hit crops in the U.K. The cargo carrier IAG Cargo said it had flown 30,000 heads of lettuce from Los Angeles to the U.K. in the past week alone. Yeah, the, Tony Clements, general manager of the Bristol branch of the wholesaler Total Produce, so the company was having to import about 30% of its iceberg lettuce and 40% of its celery from Spain and Poland when all supplies usually come from the UK at this time of year. We're not importing from the US, but people will look at that because they are committed to the quantity, to a quantity for the supermarkets. Spain is mainly growing for its local markets at this time of year, so there is not enough to go around. Some will have to look further afield. Wholesale prices have soared by more than 30% as the recent heat wave has exacerbated problems that began when the beast from the east period of cold and wet weather, if you all remember that, in March delayed planting. Obviously, there is increased demand because of the weather, but the problem is more about supply. Clement said, the British Leafy Salads Association, oh, and oh, don't I want to be a part of that association, uh, just for the name alone, said the UK crop of salad leaves was 75%. 75% of the usual yield at this time of year, while demand has, had increased by as much as 40% last week. High temperatures were affecting all farmers in the group's major salad growing areas, from Fife to Lancashire to East Anglia and Sussex. Other crops, including celery, uh, onions, carrots, broccoli, and cauliflower, are also being affected by high temperatures, which, which stress the plants and halt growth. Some growers have also been hit by the lack of rain. Tim O'Malley, the managing director of Nation Nationwide Produce, said the group was expecting the onion yield to be down by as much as 30% and that vegetables would be smaller than usual. He said the daily wholesale price for carrots was 140% up on this time last year amid similar problems. We had cold, wet spring, a cold, wet spring, which meant crops were planted late and often in cold and wet soil conditions. So the crops get off to a bad start. And now they are suffering, not just due to lack of rainfall, but also heat. At temperatures above 27 C, crops simply stop growing. And now is the vital growing period. Irrigating crops is simply keeping them alive at these temperatures, alive but not growing. Crops without irrigation are dying. <laughs> so far, guys, uh, so, you know, this is happening right now. So far, prices in supermarkets. Hey. 
I don't know who that is. So far, prices in, in supermarkets, which generally agree a contract price for farmers before the season, are not rising. Tough competition, particularly from discounters, Aldi and Little, uh, is helping to limit the impact on shoppers, but farmers, wholesalers, restaurants, oops, hello, losing something. Da -da 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 -da. Sorry. Sorry, guys, I lost my place. Um, said farmers were negotiating with supermarkets about increasing prices or changing size and weight specifications as they expect the hot weather to continue. The difficulties come as supplies of tender stem broccoli manage uh, mange tout and sugar snap peas have been hit by heavy rainfall in Kenya that has destroyed thousands of hectares of crops. In his newsletter, Total Produce told clients that there was currently no alternative country or origin available for tender stem broccoli and that supplies of fine beans, uh, mange tout, and sugar snap peas were low and their quality intermittent. Um, yeah. <clears throat> weather whiplash, weather weirding, weather um, disruption is going to is going to start hitting home, guys, like real soon. Um, it already is happening. Uh, but I, you know, I can't believe with the, you know, I, so someone just commented, I believe yesterday about the fact that there was a 121 heat index, 100, 121 degree heat index in Minnesota. Um, Oregon is having extremely high temperatures into the hundreds. Um, with the damage that everybody's getting in Southern California, um, and you've seen some of that firsthand uh, for me. And I'm gonna link another video that someone <clears throat> put on my timeline uh, yesterday, I believe it was Fiesta, uh, put a video from a, a local farmer in Southern California just showing how much damage the heat did to his crops. Um, you know, this is gonna start impacting people and you know, nobody's talking about it right now, of course, you know, on the, on the news. Um, I've seen prices kind of, uh, starting to climb, uh, at my supermarket. Other people have told me that they're seeing the same thing, but we'll just, you know, have to keep monitoring the situation over the next couple months. Um, who knows what this fall is going to look like when the crops actually, you know, are, are supposed to be harvested. <laughs> um, how much will be harvested? How much will it affect world food? Uh, availability and prices we do not know okay I found uh, I found this article about the El Nino that I was looking for the other day <clears throat> so I'll just go through it real quick it's fairly short um, I'll just give you an idea of what's going on this is from climate.gov and so update El Nino watch well uh, what do we hear favorable conditions for El Nino to develop Estimates a 50% chance of El Nino developing during late summer, early autumn, and approximately 65% chance of El Nino conditions in the winter. So far, forecasters have instituted an El Nino watch. Before we get into the potential for El Nino, let's talk about right now. We are in neutral, and forecasters expect the ENSO neutral conditions will play on through summer. The surface temperature of the tropical Pacific Ocean is close to the long-term average in most areas, including the Nino 3.4 region, which was smack dab on the average in the latest weekly measurement. Uh, moving on uh, down the article, computer model forecasts made in June are usually more reliable than those made earlier in the spring, thanks to the progression beyond the spring predictability barrier. While many of these models have been hinting at warming east central Pacific Sea surface temperatures for a few months. We can trust their predictions a bit more now that we're moving past the spring bar barrier. 
Most of the dynamical models predict sea surface temperatures in the tropic Pacific will be more than 0.5 C warmer than the long-term average by this fall, i.e. above the threshold for El Nino conditions. Several statistical models which make predictions by applying statistics to historical conditions are also currently predicting sea surface temperatures in the El Nino realm by late fall. These models are often more conser conservative than the dynamical models, and the fact that both sets are largely in agreement is lending forecasters some confidence. But wait, there's more. The temperature of the water below the surface of the equatorial Pacific has been elevated since March as a downwelling Kelvin wave formed and slowly moved from west to east under the surface. Uh, recently, a second downwelling Kelvin wave reinforced the warmer than average subsurface conditions. The May 2018 subsurface heat content is about the sixth highest since 1979. Um, yeah, it usually happens right before an El Nino. You have the Kelvin wave of water <coughs> uh, under the Pacific. Area averaged upper ocean heat content anomaly in the equatorial Pacific during May. The heat content anomaly is computed as the departure from the 1981-2010 base period mean. We care about the subsurface because it can provide a supply of warm water to the surface. As a downwelling Kelvin wave moves to the eastern part of the Pacific, the warmer waters will rise to the surface. Thus, elevated subsurface temperatures are often an early indicator that El Nino is on the way. I mean, you know. By all, by all looks of it, it's happening. Um, with all that said, it's early yet. The winds along the equator are difficult to predict more than a week in advance. And as much as westerly winds can, as much as westerly wind bursts can help El Nino develop, so easterly wind bursts, when the trade winds strengthen, can discourage El Nino. Something to keep an eye on. I'm going to link that below so you all can check that out. Um, just a moment, thought I had something else happen. Moving on to, uh, I think the last article of this video, <clears throat> this is from Vox by David Roberts, June 9th, 2018. We are almost certainly underestimating the economic risks of climate change. Um, again, equating the environment to the economy and how ludicrous that is. But, you know, let's read this. One of the more vexing aspects of climate change politics and policy is the longstanding gap between the models that project the physical effects of global warming and those that project the economic impacts. In a nutshell, even as the former deliver worse and worse news, especially about a temperature rise of three degrees Celsius or more, the latter remain placid. Excuse me, the famous DICE model created by Yale's William Nordhaus shows that a six degree rise in global average temperature with the physical sciences, sciences characterized as an unlivable hellscape would only dent global GDP by 10%. Hardy har har. Uh, projections of modest economic impacts from even the most severe climate change affect um, climate politics in a number of ways. For one thing, they inform policy goals like those President Obama offered in Paris, restraining their ambition. For another, they fuel the arguments of lukewarmers, those who say that climate change is warming, but it's not that big of a problem. Lukewarmism is the public stance of most Trump cabinet members, and it's also the public stance of most liberals. Um, and, you know, I'm sure it includes a lot of conservatives as well, but the mainstream, uh, the mainstream belief about climate change is lukewarmism. Uh, if you ask the average person on the street, they probably don't even, they probably don't even care. Uh, let's see. 
climate hawks have long had, I love lukewarmism as a term though. I think I'm gonna start using that more. Climate hawks have long had the strong instinct that it's economic models, not the physical science models, uh, that are missing something. <laughs> the current expert consensus about climate economic damages is far too sanguine, but they often lack the vocabulary to do any more than insist. As it happens, the vocabulary exists. At this point, there is a fairly rich literature on the shortcomings of the climate economic models on which so much political weight rests. Here's an old post of mine from 2015. Two recent papers help simplify and summarize that literature. They are addressed to different audiences, one the US, one the international community, but both stress the importance of improving these lagging models before the next round of policy making. I'll touch on the US forecasted focused one first, the international one second. US climate policy is more abundant. It's a good time to update models. The first paper is time to refine key climate policy models, a commentary on nature climate change by Alexander Barron. The former Environmental Protection Agency and con congressional staffer on the Waxman Markey Bill, who is now at the now at Smith College. He notes that a relatively small set of models, a handful of compute, computational general equilibrium models, sector-specific models, or hybrids like the U.S. Energy Information Administration's National Energy Modeling System, tends to set expectations and policy making in the U.S. There are reasons to believe these models are systematically underestimating climate change economic impacts and overstating the costs of mitigating it. Barron summarizes the areas where current modeling falls short. Technology costs. When it comes to clean energy technology, economics and policy are moving quickly. And because of the vis, uh, vicissitudes of academic review, the cost data used in official models is often years old, and well out of date. Plus, uh, models assume learning curves that renewables have exceeded again and again. Work to incorporate empirically supported learning rates and induced innovation is challenging but possible, Barron writes and research suggests that including innovation can significantly lower required carbon prices for a given target. Opportunities, opportunities outside the electricity sector. As I've written recently, climate policy urgently needs to broaden its gaze from the power sector and start taking on other sectors. But models inhibit that. In models, the transportation sector, and especially the industrial sector, are resistant to carbon prices. Research is needed to uh, disaggregate those sectors into subsectors and find the places where policy can gain traction and to explore the effects of electrification, widespread behavioral changes, cutting edge technologies like autonomous vehicles and other things to which models remain largely blind. Demand and energy efficiency, though virtually all decarbonization scenarios involve massive amounts of energy efficiency, we remain unable to model it very well. It is often forced into models as an uh, exogenous uh, variable, but at a flat per kilowatt cost, a kilowatt hour cost that allows little differentiation between the different potentials of different subsectors. <clears throat> Data on efficiency is not sophisticated enough to allow models to intelligently allocate resources to it and within it. All models would benefit from sustained investment in improved efficiency cost estimates. More publicly available data, updated information on, on adoption behaviors, and careful examination of model responses, Baron writes. Social benefits, models often omit or undercount social benefits like health improvements and reductions in premature mortality from lower air, air pollution, reductions in disaster management costs, and the uh, use value of a clean environment, hiking and stuff. In fact, Barron writes, none of the modeling platforms historically used to analyze U.S. climate policy produce direct estimates of the economy-wide reductions in air pollutants, let alone their economic impacts. Um, uncertainty. To reduce fixation on single scenario, Barron says policymakers should be presented with a range of project projections emphasizing how outcomes vary with assumptions and sensitivities. Modelers should strain to ensure that journalists and policymakers understand that models are not predictions and that outcomes depend entirely on our choices. These are fairly technical problems, but solutions are within the grasp 
of the research community. U.S. climate policy is likely on hold for at least four years as Trump madness as Trump madness has worked out. But this is an area where improvement is both possible and achievable. Shortcomings in existing policy models represent barriers to climate policy that can be reduced with modest resources and limited political capital. Barron writes, "It should be. It would be nice for better models to be available when the U.S. returns to sane climate policy making." All that is great, although I think it's just. Um, All of this is very important. I'm gonna keep on reading this, but I just wanted to say, and I know this is going to sound maybe unscientific, but a huge problem in relating the, the, the danger of climate change and climate change policy and awareness around climate change is that nobody cares about this kind of level of complication and this level of, you know, um, this is like policy wonk stuff. This is like political hack stuff. <clears throat> and um, I think it's just difficult for people to get past the want, want, want of all this information. We understand it and we're willing to look at it and, and grasp it and, you know, take a deeper, longer, um, you know, draft of like this information. but. You know, on the whole, you know, people need to start as much as possible finding ways to communicate the problem of, of climate change and the problem of climate change policy in very simple terms so that people can understand what's going on. Um, you know, uh, again, the complexity of our lives and the complexity of our civilization, you know, lends people to become overwhelmed and, you know, all this stuff just becomes too much to think about for people. So as much as, as much as this is important information, I just want to say like, it, there are ways that we can communicate the, the essence of the problem, um, the overwhelming magnitude of the problem in very simple, you know, meme like ways, the better. Uh, I would encourage scientists and journalists, and I, I myself am trying to find ways to do that too, um, to simplify the message so that people just can get it. You know, unfortunately, we live in a soundbite world. We live in a 140 character Twitter world. Well, uh, they up their characters. Sorry, I'm I'm late. Uh, I forget what the actual number is now, but get a little more characters in Twitter. But um, you know what I'm saying. Um, moving on, the IPCC is working on its next big report and still using models that underestimate economic damages. How dare you, IPCC? Uh, the second paper in review of environmental economics and policy makes the same point. Commonly used models are underestimating the economic impacts of climate change in a slightly different way to a different audience. The audience is, in this case, is the IPCC which is preparing to pull together its sixth assessment report to be released over 2021 and 2022. IPCC assessment reports are hugely influential in global policymaking. The models typically used to estimate effects are integrated assessment models using an unexpected, an expected utility function. That is, they add up the effects based on their probability of occurrence. Such model, models are integrated in that they include economic and climate models in interaction. And oh, way, are they going to be way off in 2021 and 2022, which are applied as, dam as a damage function to the economic models. The problems with uh, IAMs or IAMs are well explored at this point. From the National Academy of Sciences, or see above the paper's authors, <clears throat> uh, the expected utility function does not allow modelers to indicate their subjective co confidence in various sources of input data. Many difficult to quantify effects are omitted entirely. Physical impacts are often not translated in monetary terms, and they have largely been ignored by climate e economists, the authors write. In other words, IAMs have the effects, effect of undercounting risks and masking uncertainty, which is unfortunate since risks and uncertainties 
are the signal features of climate policy making. Uh, IAMs do not account well for fat tail risks, nor they, do they account uh, for ambiguity aversion. Uh, the authors write, a, wildly, a widely held preference to avoid uncertainty. If they properly understood it, people probably, probably wouldn't like the idea of betting millions of lives, and possibly the future of the species, on avoiding an outcome with 5 to 10% probability. <clears throat> the most straightforward way to better integrate tipping points into IAMs would be to increase the steepness of the damage function, right? In a 2012 paper, famed Harvard climate economist Martin Weissman proposes a steeper damage function that relies on input from an expert panel that explicitly considered physical tip tipping points, the authors write. This damage function leads to a loss of global output of around 50% for a temperature increase of 6C. Uh, subsequent research has supported the contention that proper consideration of tipping points raises both expected economic impacts and the optimal size of the carbon price. Etc. Model talk is kind of boring, <laughs> but models underlie everything, right? Uh, there's a lot of technical mumbo jumbo flying around in these conversations about models, so it's important to step back and recall the point of all of this. Policymakers want to know how much climate change will hurt the economy. They want to know how much policies to fight climate change will cost. Models provide them with answers. Right now, models are inaccurately telling them that damage costs will be low and policy costs will be high. Political mobilization on climate change is going to fight a headwind as long as policymakers are getting those answers from models. And consider that, uh, this is me talking, consider that, you know, whatever this IPCC, you know, report is in 2021 or 2022 <clears throat> is going to be so, um, most likely, is going to be so out of sync with the actual reality of what's going on in 2021 and 2022 due to <clears throat> the escalating problems of climate change. I mean, we're, we're most likely going to be in a world hurt by 2021 and 2022. So I don't even see, is the IPCC even gonna be like presenting any report? Probably not. They're probably gonna be like, are they gonna be disbanded as an organization? <clears throat> are they even gonna be around? Who's going to be around? Who's going to be doing what in 2021 and 2022? This is the reality that we are facing, unfortunately. As much as I don't want that to be true, I just have to keep stating that. This is not my desired outcome or anybody's desired outcome. This is, but you know, the fact that we're not telling people the truth about this, we meaning uh, the media in general, the government in general, policymakers in general, think tanks in general, the military in general, the fact that this is not blaring from loudspeakers on every corner of every city, in every state, in every country, <laughs> um, is a grave disservice to um, human beings at large. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so with the links below. Hope to be back tomorrow with another video. Until next time, peace. Oh, forgot to mention one thing. Uh, there's a new, uh, Robert Scribbler has been doing uh, YouTube presentations under another name. I think this, this has gotta be the Robert Scribbler that uh, we all know about. I think it's Fanny, Robert Fanny. Anyways, I'm going to link one of his latest video when he's talking about heat, um, basically all-time heat records being broken in Australia and San Diego, all over the place. Um, I'll link this in the description box below. If you haven't checked out his channel, please do so. It's really good. Very solid, solid information about what's going on. Um, and it, it's not good. It doesn't look good uh, <clears throat> is the main thrust of that. But um, check him out. Support his channel. Uh, need to support as many voices as possible out there giving real, real, real information. Um, Till next time. Peace.